This is uh, the third in our series of programs sponsored by the Humanities Iowa Speakers Bureau, and we really appreciate their support, and I hope that you did sign in. Uh, it's for their information. But this is a program put on by the Johnson County Historical Society, and I would just like to recognize Ken Donnelly on our Board of Directors, and Pat Diaz on our Board of Directors, and Leanne Giroux, our Curator, and I am Margaret Weeding, Executive Director. We also, and I'd also like to acknowledge Community Television Service, Ty Coleman, who graciously comes and films our event so that we can serve the larger Johnson County community by sharing these programs on access television. Today, however, um, the main feature is Dr. Richard Kaplan. He's Professor Emeritus of Dermatology at the, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were, <laughs> I thought I said the wrong thing. <laughs> Professor Emeritus of Dermatology at the University of Iowa College of Medicine. He founded and developed the program in biomedical ethics and medical humanities. I understand that he is also an accomplished performer of piano, and he's also a clarinetist. And the Sherlock Holmes connection, there really is one. He is the founding leader of the Younger Stanfords, which is the Iowa City Sherlock Holmes Society. And so would you welcome Dr. Kaplan? Dr. Kaplan. Thank you very much. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. As you just heard, there is a connection, at least in my mind, with the Sherlock Holmes material, but that really is a very slender connection indeed, and I'll wait until sort of near the end to, uh, to speak of that. This, uh, this talk uh, today is entitled The Importation of Leprosy into Iowa. This, uh, or the mystery that Sherlock Holmes didn't solve, that little uh, tag's kind of a come on to have attracted you here maybe, because I think Sherlock Holmes all in all sells better to the public than, than leprosy does. <laughs> but but uh, uh, I do, I will get around to talking about uh, leprosy in Iowa, uh, but I want to uh, start with some other things. I think the whole issue has to be put into a larger context, and I'll, I'll start off that way and then get myself worked down to the Iowa story. Uh, because of my years in, in academic life, it naturally occurs to me to begin with a test. Now, you can take out a bit of pencil and paper if you'd like. I will read some items to you. These will really be fairly simple, true-false kinds of things. If you wish, you can just remember your own immediate answers to, to these questions that deal with, with leprosy. Ready? Okay. I have, I have nine quick items. One, leprosy is a tropical disease. True, false is, is your, your choice. Uh, two, leprosy is acquired as a result of sinful behavior, thus warranting moral condemnation. Three, leprosy is highly contagious. Four, the animal most useful in laboratory research about leprosy is the armadillo. <laughs> At present, there are about 12 to 15 million people over the world who have leprosy. Six, the World Health Organization is leading an effort to change the world's vocabulary from leprosy to Hansen's disease. Seven, in 1990, the World Health Organization declared a goal of eradicating leprosy from the world by the year 2000. Eight, leprosy has never been seen in Iowa. Nine, leprosy has never been acquired in Iowa. Okay, you got your answers in mind. I hope that along the way I will give reveal what the answers are for those items and, and have a quick review at the end perhaps to, to sum it up. Well, let me begin with some of this larger information uh, about the nature of this problem. Uh, first, let me address one of those items that I spoke of because it, it's going to involve a kind of a confession. I, I will almost surely use the word leprosy as I go along it's very hard for me not to, but indeed the World Health Organization has been 
trying to get everybody in the world to change their language and refer to this particular illness as Hansen's disease rather than leprosy. And that relates, I think you can understand, to the, to the fact that there's a rather extraordinary taint, uh, uh, aspersions upon the, the goodness of people who would have this problem. Uh, the word is, is in, in our vocabulary and it conjures up very nasty, unpleasant images, uh, very fuzzy ones, because I think most people don't really understand what what this problem does, but it's just the notion of <gasps> kind of reaction with uh, leprosy and maybe even worse is the word leper if one is, is uh, referred to as a leper. So there is such a stigma about this word all over the world uh, that the World Health Organization has, has been pushing the effort to give it a, a name that is, that is more indifferent or innocuous. And Hansen's disease uh, that name, I think, is an appropriate one if you're looking for some alternate name. Uh, Hansen, uh, Dr. Armar Hansen, was a Norwegian physician uh, who was active largely in the 19th, later part of the 19th century. And uh, it, it will, I think, come, come out here, uh, his importance uh, in the study of this disease and our knowledge about it, and, and therefore, I think, appropriate to use his name in, in referring to it. The, uh, the taint about leprosy, I think, is a, is a story that could be elaborated a lot. I, I, th I think probably the, the reference that you would find if you'd go to, the, uh, <clears throat> to the, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and read Levitic in the book of Leviticus, chapter 13, there's a rather extensive description of, of what is to be done when someone turns up with a problem in their skin. And, and it, is, it is this business of skin that makes the, uh, the, uh, the whole problem of, of Hansen's disease uh, of interest to dermatologists particularly. And you'll hear a little bit more about, about that. Uh, the book of Leviticus in chapter 13 uh, involves an effort on the part of the priest to make some kind of assessment of what's going on and the individual who is suspected of having leprosy the Hebrew word is tsarat, and so in translation that gets turned, has gotten turned into lep the word leprosy, and that's carried down to us. So if you, if you are knowledgeable about skin problems or medical diagnoses and you read uh, chapter Levitic, uh, Leviticus chapter 13, I think you will end up, as I have, just completely confused. It, the, the descriptions, the language, um, it just doesn't identify any, any one problem with any clarity at all, as far as I'm concerned. And of course, the treatment, uh, uh, the individual was to be banished from the camp and put set outside uh, for a week and then re-examined by the priest. And if things were better, then could come back in. And if not, not. Uh, at any rate, if you read that, you get an insight into why this, mor this sense of moral failure or sinfulness or, or and the stigmatization sort of begins in the West at least, I think there. That tradition was carried on as the centuries rolled by and we have lots of uh, pictures in, in art and so on in the Middle Ages of people who had this infection. I haven't used the word infection until right now, but that becomes important. Uh, we, we have these images of people wandering the countryside with a bell or a, a noisemaker of some kind and hollering, unclean, unclean, that is, don't, don't come near me, I'm unclean, you may, you may catch this problem if you, if you come close. In the, uh, in the Christian ritual in the Middle Ages, someone who, who had this problem was considered to be dead and there was actually a mass for the dead that would be said and, and even a sort of fake burial, as it were, would, would happen so that this, this person that, that was adding to, or, or arising from this notion that it was moral failure, sinfulness that caused this person to have the trouble and, and so they had to be dealt with in this way. Uh, the, the historical record about the treatment of such people in the, in the Middle Ages uh, involved perhaps more, more helpfulness on the part of some of the church area, uh, areas and hostels and so on, and 
uh, communities that would set out food, make it available to some of these patients who, who were wandering the countryside. It may well be that many of them did not have, in fact, this particular infection. The, the diagnosis back then was you know, pretty, pretty iffy, I think. <clears throat> uh, in the in the what what is not the western part of the world, say in in uh, Africa, uh, southern parts of Africa, in in Asia, and so on, uh, though for a long long time this infection has had a stigma that's uh, almost comparable to what I've just described in in the west, and uh, even yet in modern India, for instance, where there are a fair number of afflicted individuals. Uh, the, the sensitivity of the public is very great if there is any kind of disturbance of pigmentation of the skin. Of course, most of those folks have very dark skin, and if anything changes the color, uh, darkens it, or, or lightens the color, this is something very fearful. It isn't just a cosmetic difference. It, it, it raises the specter that, oh, this, this may be leprosy, and in that case, all this whole massive stigmatization rises up and, and uh, uh, makes a great social problem. So the stigmatization is around and that, again, justifies, I think, the, the effort of the World Health Organization in uh, trying to change our language, but it's, uh, it's going to be a tough fight. Now, <clears throat> the, the present understanding of this uh, sickness is that it is, it is an infection. It is caused by a very particular bacterium. It has the scientific name of Mycobacterium leprae. It is botanically very closely related to the organism that causes tuberculosis, which is, its name is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And there are some other members of that genus that cause, cause human and animal disease. So it's rather like that, uh, that, that sort of problem, and there are some similarities, but some very important differences between uh, uh, Hansen's disease and, uh, and tuberculosis. But Dr. Hansen was the, was the person who proclaimed to the medical world that he felt that this problem was an infection, that it was acquired from transmission from person to person as other infections were, were coming to be understood to be. Now, in 1873, if you think back in, in medical history and the history of bacteriology, it was, that was a very uh, wonderfully uh, exciting time, I'm sure, because the, uh, the field of bacteriology was really in its infancy then, and, and people were making discoveries. What Hansen found was that in every, every time that he would snip off a little piece of skin from one of the patients that he was involved with, Examine it under the microscope, he would see lots of, of this particular bacterium in there. And every single time he would find lots of the bacteria, and in no instance did he fail to find it. And so he was willing to assert that this was the cause. Well, in 1873, there was no good way to, to prove that point. It was sort of guilt by association in a way. And his idea went contrary to the popular medical notion of the time, which was that leprosy, Hansen's disease, was an inherited problem. Just as you inherit other characteristics from, from parents, uh, your height, your uh, color of your eyes and hair and other things are family characteristics passed down in the generations, that this particular illness was caused by that. Now, you see, that was that was somewhat a good deal more enlightened than the idea that it was caused by sinful behavior. But, <clears throat> but the leading medical thought at, in 1873 was that it was uh, due, to, due to that. There were competing ideas that maybe it was due to diet, maybe it was due to a miasma, some nasty something just sort of bubbling out of the earth and making fumes and so on that people breathed. Uh, but, uh, but his idea that it was an infection caused by a particular bacterium was, was pretty radical and it was difficult for him to, to make progress with it. It was in 1880 that a German physician scientist, Robert Koch, uh, figured out a way to uh, grow bacteria in, in sterile medium, petri dish medium, and, uh, and do certain experiments with animals and, 
and really develop a method, method to prove that a particular bacterium was in fact the cause of a particular disease. That was an extraordinarily powerful advance. It never worked for leprosy, however, because it's the nature of this particular bacterium that nobody has ever yet been successful in growing it in a, in a dish. And it's, this is very unusual, but it, it just simply doesn't like that environment. It does not replicate in, a, in an artificial medium like that. Well, that really makes a great problem for people who are trying to investigate this thing and, and perhaps uh, develop a vaccine or develop uh, medications that would, be, that would be useful for it. If you don't have a laboratory method, uh, which in order to work with it, you've got to be able to have it and grow it and so on. Well, so th this is one of the very special problems about this infection. Well, let me move on and say a few other things about it generally. Uh, the item about it being a tropical disease, how many of you said yes in your little response to my quiz? Got one honest person back there anyway. <laughs> uh, it, we generally think of it that way, and in fact, at least certainly today, most of the patients who have this infection live in tropical areas or subtropical areas of the world. But I think it is, it is not a matter of latitude or weather. Uh, it is much more a matter of economics, of poverty, of poor nutrition, of crowding, of in inappropriate uh, or lack of sanitation. It is that, that kind of thing, not the, not the geography, uh, not the latitude. And in, uh, throughout the Middle Ages, for instance, the, the, this problem was, was rampant in Europe. And uh, in, even as far north as Lapland, uh, that the very northern part of, of Scandinavia, uh, there, there was a lot of it. Uh, there was a, a major leprosarium on an island far north in the Gulf of Bosnia, which is the, the water that uh, separates the coast of Sweden from the coast of Finland. Uh, and Norway, uh, I said that Dr. Hansen was a Norwegian physician, there was a lot of this problem in Norway, even in the 1800s, when he, he happened to be a native of the city of Bergen on the west coast of Norway. And, and there was a hospital there, a leprosarium, to take care of patients. Uh, his father-in-law uh, was the medical director, as it happened, of that hospital. His father-in-law firmly believed that this was an inherited problem. And so that when his son-in-law declared, no, it is not an inherited problem, it's caused by a bacteria that you, you get like other bacterial problems. Uh, uh, this, I, I don't know, it's not recorded clearly what conversations <laughs> went on in the family, but uh, <laughs> at any rate, the, uh, the 12 to 15 million people that I, I put that into one of the questions, that's perhaps about what the, what the uh, prevalence of the infection is in the world, and most of, as I say, most of the uh, patients are, are in tropical areas because of this, these other factors that are around. An interesting exception yet is in Nepal, which is a Himalayan country, a very high altitude of Nepal. It's in the northern section of India. Uh, I mean, it's an independent country, but in, in that area, and they, they have quite a problem with the prevalence so the, the notion of tropicality as such uh, is really pretty spurious. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, I mentioned a, a leprosarium, that word. I, I, I don't know what it would be called now, a Hansen area, except that uh, it's not really, it's, it's uncommon now that anyone who has this problem would need to be hospitalized. Fortunately, the, the uh, medications that are available uh, are for the most part, very effective. And so if someone is found to have this problem, they can be treated usually very successfully. Uh, it, it's a somewhat prolonged and maybe even a lifelong uh, course of taking medication. Uh, but uh, uh, if the problem is found, and that's not always easy, of course. And if medical services and medications are available, and that's not always easy either, uh, then the problem could be dealt with. So the, the aspirations of the, of the World Health Organization to eliminate leprosy by the year 2000, 
I don't know exactly what the numbers may be, but I'm, it's, uh, I'm fairly certain that they have not managed to eradicate it. And one of the other considerations that, that, that I do not know about is the role of AIDS. Uh, the person who has this infection is obviously an individual who, whose body is not managing to, to cope with it and, and eliminate it. Uh, and uh, not, it appears that it is only a relatively small part of our popular world population that is even susceptible in this sense. Now, if you think about it, establishing susceptibility uh, of, of, a, of something is, is a little bit hard to, to come by. Uh, I suppose unless you could take a thousand people and infect them all or try to infect them all and maybe judge how many of them get infected. Experiments of that kind are frowned on uh, <laughs> at the present, so we, we really don't, uh, don't know. But there seems to be this business of, of individual susceptibility in addition to malnutrition and poor health and crowding and lack of sanitation and so on. Uh, and my, when I speak about AIDS, well, that's an infection, a viral infection, that of course attacks the ability of the individual to ward off infection uh, of, of a lot of different kinds. And in fact, we're having, an, a, in many parts of the world, there's a very great increase in the prevalence of tuberculosis in, in patients who have AIDS. And it seems to me that under those circumstances, we might find that they were going to turn up some more, more cases of, of people who have Anson's disease than otherwise would have been so. But I, I don't know. I haven't heard or read anything about that particular detail. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, related to, to these factors that I mentioned is the matter of low contagion. My question was that it's highly contagious. And in fact, the idea of someone going around ringing a bell and saying, unclean, unclean, stay away from me, that really is spurious. Uh, this, this casual acquiring this infection with just some sort of brief or casual contact, absolutely not. It seems to take considerable, prolonged, close contact so that family members, for instance, can, can acquire it. Uh, it has been thought along the way that this was a venereal infection. Well, only in the sense that I think that, that uh, uh, families might uh, be very close in their, in their quarters and so on, but it's not, uh, it is not at all appropriate to think of it in the same way as, as the other infections that we do feel are transmitted sexually. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the infection in people is manifest almost entirely in the skin to some extent in the eyes and in the skin not only does does the organism replicate and can be found growing in in the skin just under the surface but especially in small nerves that are nerve fibers that are coming to the skin we all have loads of nerve fibers all over in our skin that's how we can feel and sense temperature and so on and <clears throat> Uh, those nerves seem to be uh, particularly attractive and the organism is found uh, gathered around these little nerves. Well, the effect of that is that it knocks out these nerves to, to the skin and so there are areas that, d that develop in, in a patient that are numb, that don't have, that don't have sensation, they don't feel that the, the, they're, they're being touched or that, or that they're being burned or injured and this is where the big problem comes because it is not just skin in general, but especially skin in, so to speak, the far parts of the body, uh, the, uh, f the ends of the fingers, the toes, the, ends of the, no the end of the nose, the rims of the ears. Those are, are the places where especially the infection seems to prosper, not internally, uh, not in the lungs or the liver and, and other internal parts, and the reason it has been thought for some time was that uh, it's a matter of temperature, that the, the skin is cooler than the interior of the body, the far parts of the skin are even cooler than that, and that, uh, that, that that's where this uh, infection occurs. And as, as these little nerves are knocked out and the individual doesn't feel pain or sensation, it may burn, burn the finger on, on a hot stove or sit too close to the fire or, other, or be injured in some way, 
and, and do damage, especially to the fingers, and uh, in the process of uh, having infection and healing and so on, gradually there, there can be resorption of the, of the bone, bony structure of the, of the digits, and, and fingers may be lost, either or toes partially or totally. The, the notion that, you're walk, that the patient is walking along and, oops, my finger just dropped off, that's, that is ridiculous nonsense. That's, that is not at all the way this phenomenon uh, behaves. It's, it's very slow, very chronic. Well, when, when the skin is injured, and sometimes rather badly in a burn or some other kind of an accident, and if it's then subject to just ordinary infection with, with other kinds of bacteria, and, and there may be then ulcers, sores that are, that are made or nasty infection, or ultimately blood poisoning. And when these people in the course of their lives, they're kind of running downhill, the nutrition is poor probably to start with, although not always, uh, but uh, gradually they may become more, uh, suffer more general decay, so to speak, uh, and uh, become more subject to blood poisoning or pneumonia. And that is how the patients die. It is, it is a secondary reason for the death. And now, with antibiotics and other supportive um, ways of treating those infections, why they can be dealt with. So this, this image of, of someone with the fingers or other parts of them uh, falling off Someone asked me yesterday about, uh, is it so that just the nose falls off? Well, no, it doesn't just fall off, but it, it certainly can have, have problems. But, but through the medications that are available now against this particular organism and, and the other organisms that may cause infection, why the, the issue can be, can be addressed. Well, let me, <clears throat> let me move along to the Iowa part of this, this story. Uh, and, and how it happens that I uh, have an interest in it. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the problem first came to my personal attention when I was a, an intern after graduating from medical school. My internship happened to be in Honolulu. And in Honolulu, uh, there was still considerable interest and residual of, of patients who were there in Hawaii because in Hawaii, starting about a century earlier, in roughly the 1850s, Hawaii began to have a lot of problem with, with this. Many, people, many patients who were infected, and it was getting to be a, a, quite a, a distress, and the government had to get into the action and so on and try to do something about it. And, and they established a hospital first in Honolulu for the isolation of these patients because they were worried about other, other people somehow catching it. And, uh, and the care of these patients. Part of it was an altruistic spirit, and part of it was a general public health safety question. And then, but, the, but the number was overwhelming, and, and there was no treatment available. Uh, I mean, as far as direct medication, they could try to help people be more comfortable and give them food and so on. But it got to be a, a very great problem in Hawaii, and so they established a, a leprosarium on the island of Molokai which is across the, the channel about 20 miles or something like that. And, and there is a very interesting place there. And it's a, it's a peninsula bordered by extremely tall cliffs, abrupt and tall cliffs. And this peninsula is almost at sea level. It's relatively small, a few square miles, almost at, at the level of the ocean. And here are these enormous cliffs. Well, it made it a very isolated place and very hard to get at or to get away from. And that was established by the Kingdom of Hawaii as a, a leprosarium. And so anyone who in Hawaii who was found to have this infection, it, it, as it developed before long, was, was sent over there. And it was pretty much a, a lifetime sentence because there wasn't, uh, there wasn't any effective treatment. And that led, after some years, in a very interesting story about uh, a Catholic priest, Father Damien, uh, Joseph de Wooster was his name, a Belgian who had come and volunteered to serve in, in the colony there. And he went there in 1873, contracted the disease, and died, himself died in 1889. And he, he's still, he's, he has been beatified, and he is, uh, has strong consideration for being declared a saint uh, in the church. Very interesting man, and this, that whole story is very interesting, but another time. In 18, 1984, I went to Honolulu uh, for a medical meeting, 
that's what I told my wife and other people, you know. Uh, but it was nice to go back to Hawaii again after we had lived there a year. But I, I took a side trip to Molokai and visited this place. And the only way you can get there then or yet is either by mule ride down a, a very dramatic winding trail that was built about a century before. So you can go down by mule or you can fly into a small uh, airfield with, with small planes. And so that was the only time in, a, in my life I've been on a mule. And it was a very interesting and, and scary experience, but absolutely gorgeous. The scenery as you went down there was, was magnificent. And then here at the bottom was this leprosarium. It is still open. There are about roughly 40 people who live there who are patients. They're not contagious. They're not in any trouble at all. But they have lived there most of their lives, and uh, the, uh, the public health people and the state of now the state of Hawaii uh, have said, if you want to stay here, you can live the rest of your life here. And so there's a small number who remain there uh, because that's, that's what they know, and they, they don't have other family, uh, and so they, they have chosen to stay there. So this, Yes, in there. Oh, yeah, yeah. There, they have been treated, and they're and they're fine. But they, it's their choice to stay there, and they've been allowed to remain. Well, I visited this place, and I, if you wish, afterwards you might come up and look at some of the pictures I have in the photo album here. Some pictures I took at the time of that peninsula. Uh, stories are still being written about it. A very recent one in a magazine from Hawaii, uh, showing the palm trees over the over the old cemeteries in the. Uh, in the settlement there, <clears throat> and and the uh, if you get to Honolulu, you there now is a right in the way middle of the Waikiki area a little museum uh, dedicated to the story and the saga of Father Damien. It's behind a very lovely new Catholic church on on the main street through uh, the Waikiki area. Well, <clears throat> we have uh, in addition to that place as a leprosarium, of course, which was established when Hawaii was still a kingdom, and then all through its time as a territory and now a state. But the United States Public Health Service established roughly in the beginning of the 1900s a national leprosarium in Carville, Louisiana, which is located between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. And that's another very interesting place. There is, there, again, it's, it's almost defunct. There is, except for people who've lived there a long time, it's, it's, it's hard to maintain it because it really is so seldom necessary to hospitalize a patient. A lot of techniques in hand surgery were developed at that Carville Institution because the hands, obviously, were, were especially vulnerable to trouble and to rehabilitate these patients. So a surgery on the hands was needed. And, and so it became a, a center where techniques for, for hand surgery and rehabilitation were, were developed in a very important degree. Uh, we now have, I think it's seven uh, Hansen's disease clinics operated by the United States Public Health Service in the large cities, New York, Miami, Houston, Los Angeles, where, where there are still patients appearing. Well, how do these patients uh, appear there? Uh, well, this is the... the uh, the importation, so to speak, because this disease as, an, as a native infection in North America seems never to have happened. There has been no recorded instance of it in a native, in one of the Native American populations. In, the, in, the, uh, uh, in all the instances that can be documented, I believe, uh, there, the, the infection is always brought into this country by someone who has acquired it outside and then came back. They might be natives of this country. As the first patient I saw here at University Hospital soon after I came a long time ago, uh, he had been born in Muscatine. He grew up in Nebraska. How on earth could he have this problem? Well, he, it turns out he was a, a Lutheran minister who was a missionary, and he had been assigned in, in his role to be the director of a leprosarium in Borneo. And for seven years, he had lived there and worked as a, as a director. Uh, I think his own nutrition and sanitation and so on were pretty good, but he had relatively close contact in, in an environment like that. And he did develop a, a mild manifestation of the problem. Uh, and it is 
he came back and he walked in. And in fact, he said, see this, this patch of trouble near my ankle. I think that's leprosy. Well, ha ha, you know, kind of the reaction. Well, he knew, he knew whereof he spoke and he had had opportunity to see lots more people with the, with the problem than any of us around here. Well, I speak of this Hawaiian connection because when I came back from that visit there, it led me to write a couple of brief pieces for, uh, that were published in the Journal of the Iowa Medical Society. And to, in checking for accuracy, I, I sent a copy of it to a, a dermatologist who was a generation older than I, who was pretty well known as a lepre, uh, internationally for his knowledge of this problem, who lived and practiced in Honolulu. And he, uh, he, he was quite satisfied with what I said, except that I had misspelled the name of the settlement. It, I had spelled it Kalua Papa, and it is really Kalau Papa. And he said that's important because in the Hawaiian language, Kalua means outdoor toilet, and that is not what, uh, <laughs> what the name of that place means. Well, it's nice to have experts at your disposal. At any rate, uh, uh, not long after that, he sent me this book, which is, for me, a real treasure. This is a book that was published in 1886 in, by the Kingdom of Hawaii. It is reporting their, their experiences with a uh, survey that they conducted in 1885. They sent out uh, uh, questionnaires to the Hawaiian councils all over the world with a, a bunch of questions about how, how prevalent was, was leprosy, what did the public, how much was spent on caring for the patients, what kind of treatment was given, uh, isolation, public health questions. The British had done the, used essentially that instrument in 1852. They were having lots of trouble with this problem in India. And they had sent a questionnaire to their consul over the world. And the Hawaiian government did the same thing. And then this book publishes the, the results and the responses from these consulates. Well, I was flipping through this, this book, and I came to this page. Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin, it says. What? I, I was quite amazed. And every time I read over the few pages here that deal with this, I, I'm just sort of flabbergasted. And it culminates with a list of eight patients by their names who, who died in Iowa in the 1860s and 70s, and one of them in 1883, eight Norwegian emigres to Iowa. Seven of them were in Winnesheek County. That's in the far northeast. Decorah is the county seat. It's a Norwe settlement of Norwegian. There's a wonderful Norwegian-American museum there. Uh, lots more uh, Norwegians in Minnesota and, and in the Dakotas and Wisconsin, but, and, and the reports are are in here, but that, that led me on a quest to find out more about the Iowa story. And, and I, uh, I began to track in uh, death records. I went to the county courthouse here in Johnson County to see what, what, just what those old death, death certificates looked like. Well, I found that that process only began in 1880. The state of Iowa instituted the, the record keeping on vital statistics, marriages, divorces, deaths, births only in 1880. Seven of those eight people that were mentioned by name in this book uh, had died in the 1860s and 70s, but, but the evidence seemed fairly clear that they, they in fact had this problem, and many of the Norwegian emigres knew what this problem was because they had family members or friends in Norway who had this. And then along the western coast of, of Norway at that time, things were pretty tough, and, and there was quite a lot of the infection there. The Norwegian government, it was Sweden at the time, Norway became independent in 1905, but, uh, but the part called Norway had quite a lot of this infection. They were the first country in the world to establish a registry, a disease registry. In the 1850s, they started keeping track of the patients. In the year 1858, there were some 2,500 patients that they had logged in that year uh, for, for this infection. Uh, they weren't, didn't know, they wouldn't have used the word infection in the 1850s. They didn't quite have that established yet. But this, this was kept until the 1970s. And there had been no, no patient in Norway with, with this infection since about the 1950s. And so they finally gave up trying to keep this registry going. But it was the first, first such thing. Well, 
this log of who there were in Iowa and Minnesota and so on was was established through through visits of, of various people and others who, who knew about it. Uh, and uh, the one who died in 1883 was the one who was the one person in that bunch of eight who did not live in Winnesheet County. He lived in Story County. That's that's Ames. The Nevada is the county seat for Story County in central Iowa. A very interesting person. And because he died in 1883, it permitted me to get a copy of his death certificate, which I, which I have here, which records that the, the cause of death uh, was elephantiasis grecorum, Greek elephantiasis. This was a, an old part of the older vocabulary, the name of, of leprosy or a manifestation of leprosy. And then secondary to, or a complication of, and the doctor wrote leprosy, it had been the patient had it for about 10 years. Uh, it is not clear whether the patient knew that he had it when he came, but he had family members who had it. He knew, he knew what the problem was. Now, that man was very interesting. He learned to speak English apparently very well and write it. Uh, when I, I went to Story County to dig out this, uh, the death certificate and looked in the in the books of the county recorder and in the eight year this man had been elected to be the county recorder for for story county and served from 1874 to 1880 1880 he did not run for re-election he was a republican and and it seems pretty clear that at that point the problem was was getting to be enough trouble that he couldn't do it anymore uh, his he the census data that I that I got showed his name and his wife he had a wife by 1880 and his wife was mentioned in the obituary notices of his death in 1883 he was apparently a very highly respected member of the community and his wife was looking after him uh, in the 1890 census there was no mention of, of the wife's name I, I, they had no children the obituary notices in the, in the Nevada and the county newspapers were very full of praise and much longer than the usual obituary notices. And his handwriting, if you want to go there and look in, the record, in all the mortgages and sales of property, it's his name signed on the bottom of all of these things. Gorgeous, hand, gorgeous penmanship, Ole Hill. Hill sounds like an English name. It's a translation of, from the Norwegian of Hauge or Haugen which is probably what the family name was, which in Norwegian, I'm told, it means hills. At any rate, uh, the people in, in the Decorah area, I could find no track of them because there were no death certificates. I, I, I suppose if I had time enough and money enough, I could really do a detective job and go hunting there on gravestones and other kinds of things, but I didn't do that. Uh, <clears throat> The story in Iowa seems to have about a 70-year gap then when there is, is no information available. There may have been other cases that, that came into Iowa, uh, but the story picks up again, for me at any rate, uh, <clears throat> when I got interested in this matter and I approached the, the records at university hospitals because I had seen a few of the, peop the patients who had been sent here from other places in Iowa uh, in the... In, in the, uh, into the dermatology department. And so, and these were all imported from other places, and that's this part of this importation story. No longer from Norway. That, that was all long finished. But uh, from India, from Vietnam, from Co one patient from Korea, two young people in 1955, children of an American uh, military person, had been born in Samoa of a Samoan wife and had grown up or started to grow up with the mother there and then were sent to live with their paternal grandmother in near Mason City as children of 10 and 11. And it ended up that, yes, they both did have the infection uh, that came to light after they'd been here for a few years and they were seen at university hospitals. The records for university hospital were available only back to 1928. So, uh, and, the, and the earliest uh, one with this diagnosis was 1955, these two children that I speak of. So there's a, a period there that I don't know about. The state health department does not cross index by disease name. So they have death certificates on record starting in 1880. And if you want to read the death certificate for every one of those people who's died, you, could, you might perhaps pick up some of the others. I didn't elect to do that and didn't have uh, 
uh, any other support or anybody I could commandeer to go and read all those death certificates to see if there were any more cases. At any rate, <coughs> uh, I, in my, with my hunting around, I ended up uh, writing a, a couple of little papers. One, uh, one that largely was the story about Ole Hill in, uh, in Nevada that was published in the Palimpsest, the magazine of the State Historical Society, and a little two-part uh, item in the uh, Journal of the Iowa Medical Society about leprosy in Iowa, which is a more medically-oriented uh, 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 piece about, about it. If anybody, you're welcome to look at that, or if you want to let me know, I can get a copy of, of that material for you. They, uh, I do say so myself, I think they're rather well written. And <laughs> the, the, but the opening sentence attracted me, uh, the one for the palimpsest begins, just as persons immigrate, so do diseases. And that's sort of that saga. Well, in the years, uh, into the early uh, uh, eight, 1990s, there were 12 cases that I was able to, to find uh, in the records, mostly from University Hospital and some other resources and talking to other dermatologists, particularly at Ames where some patients had turned up who, who were students or, or faculty members who had come there uh, from a, largely from Asia and, and uh, carried with them their, uh, the infection. Uh, <coughs> Very shortly after the article was published with these 12 patients from 1955 through 1990 or so, uh, a, a patient from India, a man who was, uh, had come to Iowa from India, was working in Des Moines, and he developed the, the problem and was sent to university hospitals for, for assessment and treatment. One other that appeared here, one other patient was a chimpanzee that was seen, it, was, it had come from the country of Sierra Leone in Africa. It was bought for the, for the primate colony uh, for the University Animal Research at, at Oakdale. And, it, and this chimpanzee started to have some trouble and Dr. Kelly Donham, a veterinarian and helpers at, the, at that place, uh, were able to establish some very excellent work that they did to establish that this chimpanzee had the, this human problem. This was the first report of it ever in a chimpanzee. Now the research, uh, and I need to very quickly finish up about that, the research, <coughs> as I said, with petri dishes in, a, in colonies in artificial medium, no, it absolutely doesn't work. It's been found that, uh, that there are some other experimental animals, rodents particularly, that can uh, it can acquire the infection. That is, if you if you take some uh, infected material from from a patient or another animal, grind it up, put it into the foot pad of an animal where it's somewhat cooler, it uh, it can sit there. It can be found much later. You can go back and still find uh, living organisms in there. But these animals don't seem to get into any general trouble, uh, with one exception, and that's the armadillo, and that. <coughs> I happen to have a couple of, whoops, he lost his tail, he's not, not, well, that, that, that might happen with an armadillo. Now, the reason, the reason the armadillo is the, is the promising and successful subject for some of this is, well, it was realized by a, a biologist, a woman working at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, who was asked by the Department of Agriculture to establish a colony of armadillos for some reason. It had nothing to do with Hansen's disease. But this, this woman, uh, it, it, with her expertise in armadillos, uh, knew or learned that the normal body temperature of armadillos is around 94 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's unusual. Most, most mammals and people uh, carry a temperature around 98, and she knew this notion that the lesions of leprosy especially occurred in areas that were a little bit cooler, and she thought maybe the armadillo uh, could, uh, could have this uh, problem and injected uh, the foot pads, and lo and behold, the infection was established. Not only that, it became widespread in the armadillos, internal organs and so on, because its temperature was lower throughout the throughout the body. So the armadillo is, uh, is, is the primary uh, research animal for it. The, uh, <coughs> uh, the, uh, 
another wonderful thing about armadillo research, if any of you happen to be interested, the, uh, apparently the female armadillo gets Im impregnated in the fall and uh, nothing happens until early spring. And uh, this, I don't know just what this phenomenon is called, but apparently the sperm is, is released or becomes available to fertilize the eggs. And armadillos always have uh, a batch of four children. They, the, the egg divides into four identical, they, so every birth is genetically identical quadruplets. Now, from the standpoint of doing research, to have a, a bunch of identical armadillos, or at least having four, that you can put into separate, uh, separate cages and do special things with and have controls, what a, what a terrific kind of a phenomenon it is. So the armadillo, uh, whose head, I think, is, is not, it is a small, has a small head, and it's not very bright, and it doesn't move very fast, but I think it's not quite as small as this. This was made and painted in Mexico, and the one, I didn't specifically mention Latin America, I don't think, but that's another part of the world where the problem exists. And uh, in the southern part of the United States, particularly Texas and Louisiana, this, this is an active pro program, I mean an active problem. And the evidence, circumstantial evidence, is pretty clear, uh, at least I'm quite persuaded, that the, that the armadillo that has come into that area, the nine-banded Venezuelan armadillo that has been moving sort of northward into, from Mexico into southern coastal Texas and Louisiana, is a vector. Uh, the, there have been animals found in the wild, not uncommonly, who have the infection. And uh, uh, if you, maybe yet, uh, around San Antonio, I, f I first saw armadillo races if you can imagine such a thing. Uh, the, uh, cowboys at a ranch for, were, were petting and holding the armadillos and then putting them down on the track, letting them go and then run to the other end and try to encourage their, their armadillo to, to cross the finish line first. Well, it's this kind of close contact that perhaps has been responsible for some human instances of it in, in Texas and Louisiana. People who had not been out of the country and seemed to be no other no other way to explain the fact that they became infected. Uh, <clears throat> well, let me finish up quickly about this, the Sherlock Holmes connection, and then perhaps uh, you might have questions for me. Uh, <clears throat> the Sherlock Holmes, th this is sort of a, f a red herring, a phony thing that I put into this, but there, there is a, one of the 60 Sherlock Holmes stories, that were the original set of 60 stories written by Arthur Conan Doyle, who was a physician. Uh, one of these, one of the late ones that appeared in the 1920s, uh, is called The Adventure of the Blanched Soldier. And the plot hinges on the, the disappearance from society of a young man. And a friend of the young man tried to find him, and, and he couldn't locate his friend, and the family rebuffed him and wouldn't answer questions. So he went to Sherlock Holmes to help him find out what was going on. He wanted to know about his friend. And so Holmes came to the estate and uh, discovered that there was a little house in the back uh, where a young man seemed to, to live and uh, with, with an older man. And uh, ultimately, Holmes, with his cleverness, was able, and this one, this story is one of the four stories where Dr. Watson is not with him. And I think that's important because maybe Dr. Watson would have been able to make a correct diagnosis, whereas it took Sherlock Holmes quite a bit longer to do the medical part of that. And at any rate, he discovered that and, and uh, brought out from London a distinguished dermatologist to verify his diagnosis. And the young man was secluded back there and had vanished from the earth by his family to, to sort of protect him because they thought he had leprosy. Uh, it turns out what he had was something called pseudoichthyosis, a different, totally different skin disease, not, not, uh, not leprosy. And, uh, and so the young man was able to return to society. Uh, but the, the reason the family thought that the young man had leprosy, and the young man probably did himself, was that he had been a soldier in the Boer War in South Africa in, uh, in roughly the year 20, uh, 1900. And he, uh, one night in the, in the heat of battle, he was isolated, alone, and exhausted, and he came to some house, and he crept into the house and fell asleep. And the next morning, he woke up and he found there were other people living in the house, and all of them were patients who had leprosy. And he 
ran out of there, but then soon after he developed this skin disease and it was his presumption and his family that he had leprosy and so they were trying to shield him because if this came to light, of course, he would be in those days uh, taken off to some isolated circumstance and be lost to society and his family forever. So that's, that's the plot of that particular story. Any part of the, this that's a mystery about leprosy in Iowa it's the mystery that Sherlock Holmes didn't solve because he was never asked. I'm sure that if he had been brought into the matter, any, any, any questions that uh, people might have had, he, uh, I'm sure, would have been able to <laughs> solve. And if any of you are interested in, in knowing more about our local Sherlock Holmes Society, well, you can talk to me afterwards about, about that. Thank you for coming.